Good day everyone. Welcome to our Advanced Hardwood Biofuels Northwest webinar. Uh, this is the second of our fall webinar series. We archive all of our webinars on the Hardwood Biofuels website. You see the link down there in the uh, lower left corner of your screen. So if you know anyone that was not able to attend today that would like to catch this or any of our other webinars at a later time, they can do that. I'm going to start with a brief introduction about our research project, which is funded by USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. They gave us funding to do this research for five years, and they were kind enough to give us a one-year extension that keeps us wrapping up the research through August of 2017. The plan of the research is to grow poplar trees and grow them more as an agricultural crop so you can harvest them with the same machine that is used to harvest corn as you see on the left side of your screen. So you harvest these trees on a uh, short rotation every three years and then you tune them into useful products such as transportation fuels, uh, chemicals made from biomass that can be used to make bioproducts. This project is a consortium of university and industry partners throughout the Pacific Northwest. It is led by University of Washington and then many other institutions are involved including Washington State University, Oregon State University, University of California Davis, University of Idaho and the Agriculture Center of Excellence at Walla Walla Community College as well as a couple industry partners. So please fill out the poll questions that are on the right side of your screen. It lets us know who you are and how you found out about this webinar. It seems that most of the people that have shown up today so far are either from government or academia. So welcome to the webinar. So now I'm going to uh, switch screens and turn things over to Dr. Nathan Parker, who is at the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. He used to be uh, at University of California, Davis. He is part of the sustainability team that works on a lot of economical models to figure out how to build a poplar biofuel bioproduct industry in a sustainable and economic manner. So I am going to turn off my mic now and turn things over to Nathan. Uh, please type in questions into the chat screen on the left side and Nathan will be able to answer those at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. There we go. Um, so uh, I'm Nathan Parker, uh, and as Patricia said, I am uh, working with the sustainability team for the Advanced Hardwood Biofuels program. Um, I work, my part of the work uh, focuses on uh, the system analysis, so looking at the, the, the system of growing poplar trees, uh, moving, harvesting them, moving them to the, the biorefinery, Getting the biorefineries up and running, and getting that that product out to the to the market, uh, and what we've done has been a lot of focus on the, this how this system is different across space within the region, um, and where there are good opportunities. Uh, so uh, let me find where I click down. Here we go. Uh, so uh, I first want to say I'm I'm giving this presentation, but the the work I'm showing is, is from a, a large team effort um, and want to highlight two people, uh, Quinn Hart and Justin Mers, who uh, are the ones who built the uh, decision support web app that I'll be featuring today in the, in the talk. Uh, but there's a whole lot of group uh, that went into providing background information and, and data sets and the like uh, in order to make this possible. Uh, so, give you a little bit of a highlight of how we're going to go through today. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss some of the regional results. So, we, we've, we've run the system analysis at a high level, uh, zoomed out to look at the, the, the whole region and where we might find hot spots of good places to put uh, biorefineries under different uh, configurations of the system. 
Uh, and then we're going to, I'm going to go through what the Decision Support web app is, uh, give you some idea of how it operates, and then I'm going to talk about three different case studies. So first, on the, uh, on the regional analysis, uh, we looked at two different products. One is uh, to produce jet fuel with a very large biorefinery, 100 million gallon a year facility. Um, and looking across the, the region, the, the, the system was cons kind of constrained about where, where the good locations are. They, they kind of all clustered along uh, the valleys on the western uh, Oregon and Washington. Um, most sites are, have uh, four and a half dollars per gallon or greater. Um, though some here in, the, in these valleys are uh, around four dollars. And that makes the, the, the system uh, a little difficult to, to, to make it work given the current prices of jet fuel and, and what uh, subsidies or, or programs are in for in place for uh, incentivizing biojet fuel. Uh, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things in this. Uh, one is that the, this region is where there is uh, a lot of pasture land that could be converted uh, to poplar production with uh, reasonable yields without irrigation. So that's kind of where we found that's where what kind of configurations of things that need to be in place in order to to make the system most uh, promising. Another thing I wanted to point out was that this system, the, the jet, jet fuel uh, production system, has a lot of costs that are not uh, feedstock related. So if you look at the bar charts uh, over here, which I'll try to, the bar charts over here, uh, um, the the, the green part is the feedstock, and everything below that is non-feedstock costs. Uh, the gray and the black are capital-related costs uh, that, that if you can find a way to, to reduce those through finding facilities uh, in place that, that could be retrofitted that can uh, improve the system. Uh, second, so because of the, the jet fuel system is not very attractive uh, under current Economics. We looked at a, a second system with a with a smaller uh, facility uh, producing acetic acid, um, and that because of the the size of the facility it has a lot more versatility in where locate when and where there are good spots across the region. So we still have the same uh, set of good locations in the valleys in the <coughs> in western Washington and Oregon, but you also have some other little spots that pop up in. Idaho and in, in northern Washington, north, northwestern Washington, and then uh, southern southern Oregon, northern California that that look attractive as well. Uh, unfortunately, these also come in at a cost above the current market price for the acetic acid. So uh, there's uh, so so we're you know, looking for ways to reduce the cost here. So that's the, at a high level, we were able to look at this, uh, but we wanted to look at when you get, if you go down and if you were actually trying to site one of these biorefineries, you'd have to start contracting with uh, landowners and finding, finding who would actually supply the, the biomass, uh, pro provide the land. Um, and then there's also some other things going on uh, at the high level that you can't capture. Uh, like capturing the, the full transportation network and um, all of these features of the geographic space that, that, that'll matter for the actual outcome. Um, so uh, we've built this web app uh, to, to, look, to look at these things. Um, where we're going is we're going to look at three case studies. Uh, one for jet fuel in, the, uh, uh, in Centralia. Uh, Washington, there's the red star here, and then uh, two other locations, one in Ida um, Hayden, Idaho, and one uh, near Salem, Oregon, uh, for producing of acetic acid. So, talking about the, the so here's the, the web application, uh, brings together 
a number of services uh, that are run within the web browser to uh, to estimate the the feedstock shed and the cost uh, the cost of producing poplar uh, whether it would be advantageous to a, a landholder to produce poplar on that on a given parcel and uh, whether that the if they can bring the par the poplar to a biorefinery uh, for a price that the biorefinery could make make work for them uh, so we have a lot of things going on here um, <coughs> one is this uh, poplar the poplar growth model the 3pg model and for that we need to know the soils and the weather of a given region uh, we have a transportation model using open street maps um, and we also have this uh, <coughs> to, to ca ca calculate the transportation cost. Uh, it all starts off with a parcel service which looks uh, at a, a, a parcel service that was developed by University of Washington looking at all the parcels in the region and finding out whether they were suitable to grow poplar. Uh, who owns them? Uh, what's the current land use? Where, is it a big enough parcel? Uh, is, is the slope acceptable? Are the soil types acceptable? Uh, and so the web app doesn't have to look at all possible parcels. It's only going to look at the, the parcels that are suitable for growing poplar. And that goes, <coughs> we look at um, the cropland data layer uh, from the USDA to find out what crops are currently grown on there. Uh, and we also have a, a farm budget app that, that looks at how much it costs to grow both the poplar and uh, the current incumbent crop that has to be outcompeted uh, for poplar growth. I'm going to go in a little detail for each of these. Uh, so for the parcel service, there's a nice picture of what the parcel service looks like. Uh, you get all these little polygons uh, located throughout the region, uh, which with whether they are uh, who they're owned by, what the suitability is, whether the soils uh, there. So that gives you the, the, the kind of a, a set of possible farms where you could grow poplar. Then you need to know what is there now uh, that the poplar would have to outcompete. Um, and there, there you have uh, <laughs> a, a, a given parcel is not going to be completely covered in one uh, uh, crop or one land use uh, necessarily. So. Uh, we're using the cropland data layer to, uh, which is a satellite imagery based data set, to find what is the maximum crop type. And we're assigning that maximum crop type as being the crop type for this particular parcel. Then we want to know what's the yield of poplar for a given parcel. So. There you need to know the soils, the, the soil conditions, the weather conditions. And we have a, a, a model that uh, is another web service uh, that we have produced. And there's a webinar on it from a year or two ago, uh, if you want to look it up. The Poplar Growth Model, this is, uh, it looks at uh, growing out poplar um, using the uh, principles of growth. and I can find out for each parcel what's kind of the expected yield over time uh, of poplar growing on that parcel. And from that, once you have a poplar grown, you know how much the, how much poplar you can grow, how much it would cost to grow it, and how much you have to pay a landowner to overcome the current cropping system. Uh, to make it a, a, a valuable proposition to switch over from poplar uh, from current crops to uh, poplar crops, then you need to know how much is it going to cost to get from the farm to the to the biorefinery. And so there's a, a transportation service based on open street maps, uh, which gives a high high level of detail, uh, understanding how you'd have to get from each of these parcels to the biorefineries. The farm budget service, which is calculates the cost of uh, producing poplar, is another 
a service that was uh, developed, uh, and it has uh, it is a it, it uh, puts together a series of operations that you needed to perform in order to grow your crop. Um, the most well built out in our current system is the poplar model, which we've based on the uh, Greenwood Resources Farm budget uh, for for growing poplar trees. Um, so you have there you have the the field. The, the the field preparation, uh, the planting of the cuttings, uh, crop care to keep down the the weeds in in early years and other sorted items possible fertilization if needed, and then harvest and then you have regrowth, um, crop care, uh, <coughs> and so on throughout the uh, seven harvest cycles. Uh, of the poplar growth and going into and that 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 over time you add up and find uh, the the cost and what what the different costs are for different operations and this budgets can be linked to local knowledge about prices of different inputs and therefore it's flexible in these interesting ways that that can be uh, utilized. Uh, here we have two different farm budgets uh, examples that are pretty hard to see, uh, but they, on the left you have the poplar uh, production budget uh, and the, the, this, you have the, the, the different operations, the field prep, the planting, crop care, uh, this is not working moves everything. Okay, can't do that. Uh, and so there's a number of operations going out over a 20-year uh, time horizon. Whereas on the right, we have a, an alfalfa budget uh, where it's a four-year cycle. Uh, and they're producing, producing uh, harvest, producing uh, alfalfa on a, a continuous cycle for four years. And you have a different set of operations. And these things can share things like the price of fuel, the price of fertilizers, uh, cost of labor in a given region. Uh, so that then for you have some consistent comparisons across uh, the different uh, uh, crop types in a, in a location. <coughs> that gives a, the basic idea of the, of the inputs into this, uh, far, this web app. Uh, the, the actual functioning of the web app, I, I should go through a little bit more than I have. Um, and that is, you pick a location uh, where you want to to analyze the possibility of placing a biorefinery. And you select a radius that you will look out over uh, the, the region uh, to collect parcels from. Uh, and that will select all the parcels in there that, has, that are suitable for growing poplar. Uh, then it will look at which crops are currently grown, um, what is the yield of poplar on those on those parcels and using the farm budgets, uh, develop a comparison between a 20-year life of growing poplar or growing the incumbent crop uh, and what the, the net revenues are from those two different possible operations and find the point where the, the price for poplar that would be required to make it so that uh, for this particular parcel, it would be advantageous to grow poplar instead of the incumbent crop. Then you find how much it would cost to get it from that parcel to the biorefinery. And so for each parcel, you end up with a far a biorefinery gate cost of producing poplar, of getting poplar there. Um, so then you get line up all your parcels from the least cost to the most expensive, and you develop a supply curve of poplar for the biorefinery, and you find the price that the biorefinery has to offer in order to uh, get to fill up the capacity of the biorefinery. Uh, there's also in there a, a requirement for a rate of return for the biorefinery, and so that, that puts a maximum price that the biorefinery would be willing to, to offer. Um, and if that price is lower than the price that it must offer, you get a warning that you have not, that, that your radius does not pull in enough poplar at the price. Uh, that you 
that that is can be offered for the rate of return that you're looking for your, in your buyer refinery. So then you can kind of go back and start again, give it a bigger radius, uh, or reduce your expectation on the rate of return, and and go through the process again and get a new new outcome. Um, so that's the syst That's how the system works. Um, now we're going to go into three different case studies. Uh, the first one is the Centralia area case study, um, and here we're looking at. Uh, an option where we could possibly uh, utilize an exist existing infrastructure at a at a, at a coal-fired power plant that may be a, allow us to reduce the capital cost uh, of the bio, of a of a biojet fuel facility, and then therefore uh, provide a, a more attractive economics for producing biojet fuel from poplar. Um, and this is in the region where that that is most attractive. Um, from our regional analysis. So we're also going to do a little bit of a comparison from our regional analysis to this local scale analysis where we're getting more more details on the parcels, uh, parcel level data that will kind of reflect whether our regional level data, uh, regional level analysis is is capturing good enough the, the local conditions. So here are the, the results for this uh, location. Uh, in here, you can see in the kind of the blues and the green dots, uh, which are parcels uh, in the region. The, the tr red triangle is the location. Uh, these, the blues and the greens are, are parcels where they can feed, a, feed the biorefinery at a reasonable cost. Um, and so those are the ones that are converted. Uh, we also have yellows that are spread throughout and there's a lot of yellows and those are uh, locations uh, parcels where it would require paying more for poplar than the buyer refiner would be willing to pay in order for those parcels to to be profitable to produce uh, poplar and then there's also red and this is uh, this is the the parcels that are identified as pasture land and that we do not allow to be included in the analysis. And this is a, a feature where the, the most attractive thing for our model is to convert pasture land. Uh, and we are, not, uh, we are not fully confident that the, that the economics that we have captured here for pasture are, are, are matching with, with reality. Uh, and so we have limited the amount of pasture land that can be converted. So by setting a percent uh, pasture land that can be converted, in this case it's 25% of pasture land is allowed to be converted that's within the whole radius. Um, and if once you get up to that 25% of the pasture land, then you can't pull any more from pasture land. So those red areas are areas that could be uh, attractive pasture land if if you can get that get them all to convert over to to poplar and um, so in that case you would have a, a big a benefit uh, lower the cost um, then I'm gonna, on the next case today I'm going to explore uh, the sensitivity to this uh, but in this case I'm, I'm just presenting one one scenario of this which is 25 percent of the pasture land So the outcome here is we you, you have to go out 200 kilometers in order to get enough uh, poplar to feed this large facility. Uh, so you're going kind of all the way up to near Bellingham uh, and all the way down to near Salem uh, to, to to fill up this biorefinery. Uh, but and you're using principally pasture land, and and you're ending up with a a uh, Poplar production of that our poplar jet fuel production of around four dollars a gallon, which is an improvement over the the regional scale analysis. And the main main area where that improvement's coming from is by reduced capital cost um, by using this the retrofit. Uh, this is got the out some of the outputs of the of the model where it looks at the the capital cost, how much investment, 
the full operating costs over the whole life of the facility, the, the poplar, the cost of the poplar over the life of the facility. So this is 20 years worth of poplar, poplar production. You get a total cost, um, the total income, and you find a rate of return and the, the present value. Um, so this is kind of, uh, this is a, a sampling of the, the outputs from the decision support model. And we found that the retrofit reduces costs by about 30 cents a gallon. Um, making this a improved choice, um, which means that our uh, our local scale model is actually estimating a slightly higher cost uh, for a non retrofit than uh, than the regional model is. But it, and some of that is with differences in uh, some differences in where where the poplar is grown. Uh, so this is a, a chart comparing our regional scale model to our local scale model about how far out, how far away you need to go to get poplar. Uh, <laughs> the uh, local model pulls in the majority of its feedstock coming from the, the 25 to 75 kilometer range, whereas the, the, the regional model has, has a lot more in the t under 25 range. And then some off in the in the higher higher distances. And I move to the next case study, which is a, a, a facility producing acetic acid um, near Salem, which is uh, Dallas, Oregon. Uh, and we're going to test the sensitivity of this pasture availability issue here in this in this case study. So here's the results, kind of basic results, uh, throwing all all the re all the main results from the model kind of tossed onto one screen. You have the map of where the where the parcels are located um, that, that supply the facility. You have this big area of blue pasture land um, off to the west, uh, <laughs> and a smattering of smaller smaller parcels, kind of off to the east. Uh, the majority of this is coming from grass haylage, which is, which includes the pasture, um, so that pie chart. Of, uh, but it's also pulling in some from 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 corn and from oats. Uh, and this is producing at a uh, acetic acid at roughly six hundred dollars a ton, uh, with a 10 10 percent rate of return. I'm going to go. I'm going to blow up that supply curve, uh, so we can see it a little better. Uh, you can see, if you look at the top lot, red line there, that's the, the pasture land. Uh, it starts to head down uh, where you're converting the pasture land to poplar trees. Uh, and then it hits a, hits a limit and gets stuck there. So that's, a, that's that pasture limit that's, that's uh, reducing the amount of, of land that can go uh, from pasture over to poplar. And then we have uh, the green line showing where the conversions of from corn to poplar are uh, at different at the different prices, and this line here going up vertically is the price point where we are uh, filling up our biorefinery. <laughs> so we're going to test this uh, system out a little bit by changing the amount of of pasture land that's available. Uh, so if you go from zero percent out to 50% of the pasture land available, the delivered price of poplar ranges from about $95 a ton down to uh, <coughs> about $57 per ton. So it was a pretty big, pretty big range, so it's fairly sensitive. Um, it's kind of got two main, I guess, I'd say three main regions. One is at the very low end, it really, you get a lot of value. Um, by getting up to 5% pasture um, conversion. Uh, and then you have kind of a, a you have a little bit of a, a flatter region uh, where adding more pasture doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, and then <laughs> there's another uh, kink down to it uh, where the it becomes around around 35% pasture land availability that there's kind of a, a dis, little bit of a discontinuity it drops down a little bit more that it's the cost drop down a little bit more and kind of flatten out again 
Um, and beyond 50%, it's roughly, uh, it's, it doesn't change very much because you, you've pulled in all the pasture that's nearby and that's, and that's what matters. Um, so if we look at, if we look at these kind of the extremes of these two systems, the 0% pasture land, you have all this red where you can't use, where the pasture that we would like to use is not available. Um, and then the fields that are converting to, to poplar are mostly corn, oats, and some wheat. And they're smaller, smaller parcels and they're interspersed throughout the region, mostly to the east of the facility. Um, whereas in the 50% pasture, you have a lot of the, a large, a lot of the par, large amount of the pasture, a lot of the amounts of the land is coming from pasture land. Um, and it's mostly off to the west of the facility. Okay, well, we're going to go through the final case study, which is um, a Hayden area case study. And this, this location, we're, we're interested in, again, we're going to look at the smaller scale acetic acid production. Um, but we're also going to look at uh, kind of things that are pushing beyond what, what our current web app can do, uh, but are interesting uh, in terms of looking at using wastewater for irrigation and usually using a supplemental feedstock of wheat straw. So in this, in this region within 75 miles of the Hayden location, there's about, there are 24 wastewater treatment plants and they have about 70 million gallons of water per day that are treated uh, and that could be utilized uh, to grow, to provide the irrigation to grow poplar trees. Um, there's also a significant amount of land that's uh, in wheat and there's roughly 20 to 40 thousand tons per year of sustainably available wheat straw in the surrounding counties mostly off to the west but uh <laughs> but there's there's a significant wheat straw resource that could be uh brought to bear on the facility so if we look at these uh, kind of supplemental uh systems for providing uh, feedstock to our facility. The wheat straw if you could produce about uh, 25,000 tons per year it would be a pretty reasonable amount to expect out of that that area. Uh, you can get if you have wa wastewater that's on land that's like right next to the wastewater treatment plant you could you could get another you could get about 5,000 tons of poplar on that land. Um, but if you were to to take the wastewater and and move it out, uh, just build a pipe out out of the out of the town where it is, and out, out to the fields, um, you could get up to eighty thousand tons provided uh, from poplar grown on that wastewater. So this is from our web our, our decision support web app. What this region looks like for for growing poplar trees. Uh, these blue areas are, are the parcels that are selected uh, for growing the poplar trees in this area. Um, and this is for the full, filling the full uh, facility up with poplar trees. Um, and then <laughs> what's kind of interesting in this area is, is the resource base um, is kind of a little bit too small for 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 filling this facility up. Um, so you get out, um, you have this kind of high end where you have to go out a much higher price. Uh, you have to ask ask for a lot more, a lot higher price for poplar in order to induce people to grow the poplar uh, to get those last uh, 10,000 10, tons of poplar into the facility. So if you were able to supplement with wheat straw. You are able to, if we look at the, the supply curve here, if you supplement with wheat straw, you're able to move from $110 a ton price down to an $89 a ton price. And so that, that's a significant reduction in, in, in the price that you have to pay for your feedstock um, by utilizing this uh, wheat, wheat straw resource for a relatively small fraction of the, of the total facility. So it's like 10% of the facility 
Um, but then you get down into a, a fairly elastic area of the, of the resource base. If, if you're providing 80,000 tons of, uh, of the poplar using, uh, using the wastewater for irrigation, that's going to reduce your, your, your cost of growing poplar trees because then you get to have a value, you're providing a value by accepting the water off the wastewater treatment plants, and you're not having to pay for irrigation. Um, and that, that reduces your cost, uh, the price you need to pay for the, for the feedstock down to around $79 a ton. Uh, and, and that's a pretty significant reduction from $110 uh, dollars per ton down to $80 dollars per ton uh, to lower the cost uh, for this a facility in this area. So these are kind of the opportunities that we're looking at as, as interesting uh, if you if you're limited in scope and only looking at uh, growing poplar trees on agricultural lands or ag, ag adjacent lands uh, with irrigation or without irrigation and you're not looking beyond that to, to, to diversify resources that could be used then you're going to miss out on opportunities that could have a pretty significant impact on the economics. Um, so this is uh, showing what that means to the bottom line of the facility. Uh, for this area, if we only looked at growing poplar uh, for on, on ag lands using the irrigation that you're paying for irrigation water, uh, it's up around 650 uh, a ton. But if you add the wheat, if add wheat straw and the wastewater treatment water for irrigation, you get down to below $600 a ton. Um, so there's a pretty significant reduction in the feedstock related costs. So we reduce the feedstock cost by 25% and the total production cost by 12. So some, this, some things we found out by looking at these, uh, looking at these modeling uh, from two different perspectives. One uh, kind of from the airplane level zoomed out uh, looking at the world as, as pretty large pixels uh, that could be converted to poplars to looking at a local scale we're incorporating the parcels and the actual transportation network in more detail. Uh, if I got kind of some different results and different conclusions of how these different uh, analyses should be used. Um, <coughs> and in general for uh, For, uh, I, I focus on the on the bottom table here of, of which actors uh, could be utilizing the different types of resources. Uh, government, the regional scale model is is, is useful for for government kind of ana analyzing the system. Uh, what is the possible potential for this system? What could it do to help with uh, renewable fuel mandates and and low carbon fuel standards and other. Uh, things that you might be interested in, uh, what's kind of the gross potential here, uh, whereas the, the local analysis kind of will, will give you a feel for what to expect from a, a, an individual biorefinery. But industry, the regional model is good for scanning and looking at where are the general regions that are attractive, uh, Whereas the local scale model, the decision sort model, can tell you whether this particular location is, is, a, is a viable location. Uh, for research, the, the regional model is, is nice to, to capture, kind of, just kind of aggregate all of this information into, for a whole region, um, get all of the, the different, info, different uh, impact factors that you are interested in, uh, build them off of, off, off of this simulation of what the region looks like. Uh, <laughs> the local model is very good for validating that region, regional model, let, let you know whether, whether that's going to be giving you the approximately correct answers um, or if there's something going on that we have to change some assumptions uh, in the regional model to make it match up with what is more likely to happen on the ground. And if you want to look at just individually one-off uh, local impacts, you can build in to this kind of system, which is not in there yet um, in our version, uh, 
more on the local impacts uh, for a given facility. Uh, in summary, this web app, uh, it enables fast exploration of potential, potential sightings, uh, which is fun. You can pop around and look at the, the well, if I put a biorefinery here and one over here and see what they look like. Um, it gives you gives you some pretty good pretty good fast information. Uh, the pasture land availability is critical for low cost biorefinery sites in the region that we've we've found. So this is an area for where we're we're working on improving uh, the economics of this so we can feel so we'll uh, uh, get to the point where we may not need to use these ad ad hoc factors to reduce pasture land availability. Uh, <coughs> Uh, but we, that's that's the the current and future research. Uh, but but for the time being, it is a very important factor in whether that that land is available to get low cost sites. Uh, diversifying feedstock supply can improve the economics, and then <laughs> in some locations you could get around thirty two percent of the feedstock. Uh, so that Payton location, we we were able to get thirty two percent of the feedstock provided from from Papa grown on on wastewater effluent which is pretty an interesting finding. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge all of the uh, partners on this project and USDA for the support. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, my email address is there if you want to contact me. Um, and I am happy to take any questions anyone has. So thank you, Nathan. Thank you, everyone, for attending the, the webinar today. I see that quite a few of you are typing in some questions for Nathan, so thank you for doing that. Just wanted to let you know that we are going to have uh, more webinars coming up in the new year in 2017. The Policymaker webinar, we just decided yesterday that that will be on February 1st, which is a Wednesday. And then we're working on scheduling a poplar genetics and containment webinar with our researchers from Oregon State University to be sometime in January. So I see lots of questions coming in, and so I'm going to turn this back over to Nathan. Thank you, everyone. And uh, please fill out the poll questions on the right side of the screen, and have a good day. Okay, I'm going to try to start at the top. Uh, are we going to get this presentation? I, so the, the webinar is going to be available. I, I can provide the, the slides if you'd like. Um, I don't, maybe uh, Patricia could comment on that uh, in chat. Uh, the cost, and Rodrigo asks the, the cost of a uh, wheat straw per ton. Uh, this is, I have not done a, well, I haven't done a local analysis here to look at the markets. Uh, of of wheat straw in this region, I in the past analysis, uh, such as the billion ton study for the uh, Department of Energy, uh, finding the wheat straw in this in this area would be available for less than the price that I have uh, put in there for the the asking price, so something in the realm of seventy seventy five dollars a ton. Um, then where next question is when considering mixed feedstock, does the tool take into account any additional operating costs such as uh, you have uh, multiple you're going to have you're likely to have multiple different uh, receiving types of equipment, uh, especially if you're doing things as different as straw versus wood chips, uh, different chemical treatments. 
Uh, and that is not something that is uh, that that we have as a uh, feature that we can that the model can handle at the moment. Um, it is definitely uh, an interesting uh, question. I, I think it's uh, for the for this case study. I mostly was uh, pointing out the the opportunity for reduction of the feedstock cost, but as you could see, uh, that the feedstock cost is not the main the main cost of the facility. So if this, if providing a mixed feedstock uh, requires significantly higher capital or significantly uh, higher um, operating costs, then that can uh, overwhelm that that feedstock cost improvement that I that I found. Uh, so the uh, question of where is the web app, and I don't know if uh, so. Right now, the web app is is in a is a prototype, um, and we are currently writing a paper documenting it. Um, I can provide a link in the chat, unless Justin jumps up and down and says not to do that. Uh, for people who are here to, to go play with it and try it out, uh, but it is still currently in a prototype status, uh, so uh, it will be, well, oh, there, Justin provided it, so there it is in the chat box. Um, so it, uh, feel free to go play. Um, if you find anything that you think is funky or weird, please contact me or Justin. I think there's actually a way to do it within the web app uh, to to alert us of of issues, and we're we'd be happy to. <coughs> yep, there. Listen to Justin. Uh, so yeah, that that'll that'll be a great help for us actually. Uh, next question: Trying to predict the sweet spot for poplar pricing for the grower. The fuel acid she looks like from the Dallas example is around seven dollars a ton. How to interpret that graph? Um, so that's the uh, the price. The so the that would be the supply curve graph where you have at different prices for poplar, you have different levels of adoption. Uh, farm gate or not not farm gate uh, buy refinery gate prices for for poplar. We have different levels for adoption. Um, so, at as you increase the price, it becomes more and more attractive uh, for poplar growers to, to grow poplar, um, but it's less and less attractive for the for the buy refinery. So, in that uh, baked into that supply curve, the top end of that supply curve is the point where the buy refinery can no longer uh, make profit. Um, so <laughs> the, the price that is chosen along there uh, is the price that, that brings in the feedstock. So we, I would, interpreting this is, is, an, is a fun, fun exercise. Um, the, uh, it, it depends on, on who has knowledge of what. Uh, and so, if the if the buy refinery owner had perfect knowledge of what the cost and opportunities of all the poplar producers in their regions were, and were offering a single price at the buy refinery gate for poplar, the price chosen by the model is the price that would be seen, because that way the pop the the buy refinery is getting the poplar it needs at the lowest possible price. Uh, because if he goes below that price, then it's not going to get as much popular as he needs. Uh, so if you go above that price, if you need, so above this price, so for, from, where am I, yeah, from here to here, uh, in this example is the, is the area where you kind of have negotiation. <laughs> So if if the if the popular if the buyer firing knows knows everything they're going to set their price at this point because that's the lowest they could possibly 
uh, pay and get as much poplar as they need. The growers may be able to negotiate up higher um, depending on how things how things happen in the contractions contracts up through to approximately ninety five dollars a ton in this case before uh, the the buyer refinery is not able to support themselves. Um, that's kind of hits the the lowest threshold for internal rate of return at the price baked into the model, and so that price is uh, four dollars a gallon, and so. If they cannot receive four dollars a gallon, then this whole thing gets compressed down, uh, and that that changes this what the what the top end looks like. Hopefully, that is a decent explanation. <laughs> did, did that answer the question? I feel like I, I may have I may have flailed there a little bit. So I think that answers all the questions. Okay, if there's no other questions, I'm going to mute and let Patricia. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the detailed explanation of the uh, acetic acid scenario at Dallas, Oregon. I just added the link to where the webinar will be posted. We should be able to do that by the end of the week. And please uh, try out the model as Nathan and Justin suggested and provide them any comments on how to improve. At some point in time all these models that uh, Nathan and the sustainability team have been making will also be posted and available on our hardwoodbiofuels.org website. So thank you again for attending. Have a good day and we hope to see you at the webinars that we will be hosting in 2017. Bye-bye. Take care.